Good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I'm in the presence of a very special guest. His name is Matt Nelson, and he's currently at the University of Miami at Four Gables. He's in the Department of Political Science. He obtained his PhD at Northwestern University um, in June of 2020. And that's relevant because we're going to be talking a lot about Chicago today. And Evanston, in Illinois, is where Northwestern is located. He obtained an MA in Social Sciences at, from the University of Chicago. And he has BAs in Political Science and Asian Studies from St. Olaf College. That's right. And, and where's that located? St. Olaf College is located in Northfield, Minnesota, about 45 minutes south of the Twin Cities. Okay, awesome. So anyway, Matt, welcome to the show, and I appreciate you accepting that invitation again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I'm so looking forward to this. Um, just I, I felt honored because you kind of let me get a sneak peek into um, his book that's going to be published later in the summer uh, called The Color of Civics. Um, he was gracious enough to let me look at the drafts leading up to the publication of the book. So I appreciate that. I enjoyed the manuscript a lot. I learned a lot from it. And hopefully the audience can also can kind of get a grasp of um, what your work is like. I guess my first question for you would be, um, how did you get into um, civics before we get into definitions and, and what that entails? Um, how was your upbringing and, and what kind of got you into developing politically as a person from an early age on? Yeah, so I grew up in a strong union family. My dad was a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So growing up uh, every summer, every holiday season, we spent quite a bit of time at union functions. And while the sole purpose of those get together certainly wasn't all about politics, there were certainly political discussions happening in those spaces. And once I was an undergraduate student, and even as a high schooler, I started hearing about which political candidates my father's union would endorse. Uh, it would make me very interested in those candidates and trying to figure out why it was that a union was deciding to support this candidate over another. And it was actually through one of his union's endorsements of a candidate that I started working on my first political campaign during my sophomore year of college. So I grew up in a family that kind of shoved aside the common knowledge that you shouldn't talk about topics that are political over dinner. We definitely had conversations about politics quite, quite frequently. So I would say I've have always been interested in politics, and I consider myself lucky that I've grown up around individuals who wanted to talk about politics and encourage me to develop my political voice as well. Awesome. And um, you're from Minnesota originally? That's right. Okay, St. Paul area? St. Paul area, that's right. Okay, shout out to St. Paul and also um, our mutual friend Jamie Brooks for getting us um, connected. I really appreciate that, Jamie. Um, this is going to be great um, to share with your audience and my audience as well. It's funny, just some of the stuff you mentioned then about your political involvement at such an early age, because um, I have a similar story in the sense that uh, my dad is really where I got my strongest political influence from growing up. But that kind of goes contrary to what you describe in the book a lot of times with some of these students that you um, interacted with. Um, there's almost a complete absence of that. Um, a lot of people in this country are not politically educated from a beginning um, stage in their life. And um, I think that's where your book uh, problematizes something that's um, definitely relevant, is very relevant because that is um, something that's prevalent in this country is a lack of political um, knowledge. But there's always this, um, there's a sentiment to participate in politics even when you may not necessarily have the tools and information politically in your mind to be prepared to be the best citizen up front to, to participate in this electoral politics process, which is something that I find interesting. But um, I thought that was, um, that was one of the first things I noticed when I read the book. Obviously this person has a lot of political knowledge, background knowledge, but I don't think the average person has that knowledge. Is that something that you acknowledge is the truth or do you find people are more politically inclined than we give them credit for? That's a really good question. So 
going back to some of the experiences that you shared from your own life, which also match up a bit with, with mine. So parents and households are certainly the most critical sites of political socialization. So we know from decades of scholarship that young people have discernible political beliefs even before they reach voting age. And oftentimes that is the direct results of their parents' political beliefs. So I first want to note, even though the book is about, about schools, uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, the home and also community institutions, be it places of worship or community organizations, also play a really critical role in developing political knowledge at a young age. But I think the reason school is so important is because it's an institution that all children uh, pass through at some point in their childhood, at least those who you know, are not homeschooled or do not attend uh, a private school. It does provide an opportunity to essentially level the playing field by providing a space where young people are able to develop this political knowledge. Going to your second question about, you know, who is and who is not politically knowledgeable. One thing that I take on directly in the first chapter of the book is how it is we define political knowledge. And I take a pretty critical approach to this. So oftentimes the way in which we determine who is or who is not politically informed is by asking them a series of four to five questions about uh, political institutions at the federal level. So for example, can you tell us that Kamala Harris is the vice president of the United States? Can you tell us that John Roberts is the chief justice of the Supreme Court? And while knowing those pieces of information might correlate to how politically knowledgeable you actually are. I argue in the book that there are these untapped sources of political knowledge out there that social scientists such as me oftentimes don't even think to ask. And the reason we don't think to ask those questions is oftentimes we're not embedded enough in communities, which is ironic. We're social scientists. We're meant to understand how it is that people think, but so often we develop these measures for what knowledge is uh, from the comfort of our offices rather than spending time in communities. So in the first chapter of the book, I talk about how young people uh, actually possess a great deal of political knowledge simply by living their lives, navigating their own neighborhoods, and we just simply haven't figured out how to measure it. And one study that I point to quite a bit in the first chapter is a, a piece of scholarship by one of my mentors, Kathy Cohen, who talks about knowledge about carceral violence. So, for example, if we ask young Black people or young Latinx people in the United States some of these questions about political institutions, it may look like they're, quote unquote, less politically knowledgeable than their white peers. But if we ask them about victims of police brutality, for example, they have uh, significantly higher rates of political knowledge than their white peers. So what I try to say in the first chapter of the book is, you know, we have these untapped categories of political knowledge that go unaccounted for, and the types of political knowledge that are meaningful uh, differ quite a bit based on the identity, the experiences of, of different people in the United States. Okay. That's, I'm glad you, I wasn't going to go too much into the chapters and stuff. I'm glad you did because um, <laughs> it, we were going to lead in that direction anyway. But I wanted to establish something before we continue. Um, what is civics um, to my audience and to myself? Because I took that word for granted. I never really understood what civics meant. What does civics mean? Yeah, so the way I de define civic education as any course that attempts to instill the knowledge, skills, historical knowledge that allows young people to feel able and empowered to participate in politics. So the way in which our education system is set up uh, gives a great deal of power to individual states in terms of determining what civic education is. So the state where I'm from, uh, Minnesota, has a standalone civics course that you take in eighth grade. Uh, in the state where I conducted this research, Illinois, uh, high school students have to take two civics courses. But in other states throughout the country, many of the civic skill standards are embedded into other social studies courses 
uh, most prominently American history. So I take a pretty broad definition in terms of what civic education is. Again, any course that aims to instill within young people the knowledge and skills that allows them to participate in politics. Theoretically, that could be any course, that could be math, that could be environmental studies, uh, it could be biology. Uh, in my book and in my research, I focus on social studies courses just because historically they've played the biggest role in terms of attempting to foster those skills and those knowledge categories explicitly. So to say civics is synonymous with social studies would not be 100% correct. Um, it's a good question. It's certainly a piece of my work that I think individuals would you know, maybe furrow their brow at and think, you know, you talk about civic education as also being American history. The civics course I had in high school was about the three branches of government, how a bill becomes law. But from a national perspective, I do think that social studies broadly taps into these different civic skills. But, you know, some states' civics might be the functioning of government and other states, that same class might be called American government. So I take the position that, you know, whether we say civic education or whether we take social studies is really a question of state by state education policy and a bit of semantics as well. I, um, I found it interesting that you chose Chicago as a case study, but it makes sense to me, I guess, because you, you're familiar with the area, you know, you were educated there. Um, presumably you lived in the Chicagoland area. I've been to Chicago about five or six times. Actually, two episodes ago, I interviewed Jay Clark, who lives in South Chicago right now. And um, he's been on the forum a couple of times. And we've talked a little bit about the demographic differences in Chicagoland. And that obviously came to play in your book um, when you talked a lot about, I think you said out of however many, like over 670 public schools in the area, only one was plurality Asian American. And um, that'll go into a question I have in a minute, but I was just curious to, um, how, how does that disparity, depending on what part of Chicago you're in, affect your work in the book? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I describe in the book, Chicago is an excellent uh, case study, if you're interested in studying any sort of political process, interested in race, class, uh, inequality in the United States, simply because it's, uh, you know, what some people have described as a social laboratory like no other. It's an incredibly big, incredibly diverse city, but it's also one of the most segregated cities in uh, the country. So when you're thinking about differences in educational opportunity, depending on the parts of the city you're in, uh, even from a broad level, it goes to access to whether you even have access to a neighborhood public school. So there's a great series of articles and books by the political scientist, Sally Nwima, who looks at how there have been significant disparities in the city of Chicago in terms of which students have access to public schools. So in 2013, uh, the Chicago Board of Education closed 47 elementary schools in a sig single year, uh, and 90% of the affected students were Black students in the city. So when you're thinking about questions about education and educational equity, uh, Chicago is really important because even in a city that I think much of the country views as incredibly uh, progressive, you see local level policy that um, really makes it difficult for young people of color and young black people in the city to have access even to a school building in their their neighborhood. So place becomes a really important aspect of exploring how policy uh, is implemented in the city of Chicago. And just to clarify for the audience, um, I'm very specific on giving data and stuff. And I know you are too, being a social scientist. Um, just to give some clarification, this is based on Matt's um, case study, I think a couple of years ago when you were developing this book, uh, there's 642 public schools in question out of 77 communities within the Chicago area, just so people are clear. And we're talking about 350,000 people. And that's based on his book. Um, yes, 
that's the impression I got in Chicago when I every time I've gone, you can clearly see the um the different demographic changes depending on where you are in the train system in the L. I mean, you go on the blue line um going west and the racial components are completely different from the loop area. It's just and the north side couldn't be any different than a lot of the surrounding areas of Chicago, very affluent areas. Evanston, Skokie, those types of areas um, tend to be a lot more um, uh, closer to the lakeside. And and this stuff is very much um, by design. I think um, I think a lot of large cities are like this, where you have um, this perception of diversity. But if you analyze it enough, you really see that a lot of these neighborhoods are quite segregated, even in these big metropolitan areas. And, and people are, in a way, um, confined to certain areas within a big city like Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston. I mean, anywhere you go in the country, it's like that. And I think that's something that stands out too when you had your graphs. I loved graphs, by the way, and because you can kind of see empirically what Matt is trying to explain as far as these disparities. And so obviously that's going to affect the education system, the educational um, tools that are implemented depending on which district you're in. Um, that stuff I'm on board with 100%. I do have some critiques of like, um, not necessarily your work, but some potential problems when you define, I guess, marginalized communities. Because when you say marginalized communities, it's assumed that you're talking about primarily Black people. And you mentioned Latin people as well. And then you really didn't have much of a case study for Asians, like you said, because there wasn't the population there to really... Um, help with the data to sort of complement the data. But wouldn't a lot of this stuff speak to a class component too? I saw a lot of racial emphasis, but I didn't see as much of a class emphasis, especially when we talk about non-Black people. And maybe that wasn't part of your intentions or, or your studies interest. But I think marginalized communities doesn't just apply to quote unquote people of color. I think that applies to white people too, because I think what you're speaking to is a class struggle as much as it is a racial struggle. Yeah, those are all good points. So, so you mentioned the the subpopulations that the book focuses on. It does focus on um, young Black people, young Latinx people, and young Asian Americans. As you pointed out, much of my sampling was done at the high school level. So while you could go through different neighborhoods in Chicago, for example, Chinatown, and certainly find elementary schools that are majority Asian American, uh, Chinese American specifically, there is not a single high school in the city of Chicago that is majority Asian American. There's one plurality Asian American school. So that speaks to you know, just the landscape of demographics of schools and the difficulties of, of sampling in a city like Chicago. With your second point, you're absolutely right. So marginalization occurs on multiple different dimensions, accesses, race being one, I would argue, the most important in this country, class also being incredibly important, gender, sexual orientation. And I do try to draw the reader's attention to, uh, you know, where these uh, overlapping dimensions of marginality do occur in cities like Chicago. So for example, I try to highlight, you know, what some of the effects of some of the experiments I conducted, how they look in a poor black school versus a more racially integrated school with fewer students who have access to free and reduced lunch as a metric of socioeconomic status, for example. Mm -hmm. The unique thing about Chicago, though, as it relates to education is if you look at, you know, the proportion of young people who attend Chicago public schools, even though there are a ton of young white people in the city of Chicago, only 10 percent of students served by Chicago public schools are white. And the reason being is so many parents in the city, so many white parents in the city opt into sending their white kids to these more affluent private schools that I did not have access to. So when you are talking about Chicago public schools, we're absolutely right that it certainly serves student populations that 
are socioeconomically diverse. Uh, you're certainly, I certainly agree that um, socioeconomic disadvantage is a dimension of marginalization. It is a district that overwhelmingly serves uh, poor young people of color. And, you know, also just from an epistemological perspective, I'm trained as a, as a race scholar, not as a class scholar. So while I think it's important to uh, be aware of how class operates, it's also important for me to be aware of my own positionality and expertise as a researcher who, who just doesn't research class as much. And, 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 and props to admitting that because um, we do a lot of similar work. Like I work with black men a lot of times. I work with LGBTQ and Latin American Caribbean. I work with women writers as well, but I'm a literary critic and a researcher uh, more than anything. But uh, that's why I love reading books because I love to take this information in. I mean, it's so valuable. Um, but 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 when I'm critiquing something, people understand like once they see it, it's like okay, he's not like shooting down the book. He's just simply pointing out other connections, you know, that could be there. And for me, I do a lot of racial um, emphasis in my scholarship, but with with the intersectional lens, especially being bigger than ever now, I don't know if you can separate the two. I think I think more than ever now. Um, I guess my point would be for your work that you're doing, social class would have to be a significant component because um, especially if we're talking about politics, but we're maybe coming from a different point of um, beginning. I think the biggest point of beginning that we have is that when you read this book, it almost presupposes that the political system is more or less stable and intact because the information is presented as, okay, civics we need to learn about, um, the branches of government, we need to learn about the constitution. These young students need to learn basic things like what is the electoral college and what are the requirements to be a president? Like I totally understand that people should know that the average American should, but the issue I have more so, and that's part of the reason why I created the forum is to sort of be an anti-establishment because I think the common knowledge will tell you that the political system is stable, but I question significantly how stable um, our political system is because I feel that we have a corporatocracy and not a democracy. I don't think that we live in a democracy. And um, I might get clarification from you as far as what you see as democracy because you use that in the book, Democracy in the Schoolhouse, the original manuscript. And I'm just curious, what does that democracy look like to you? Because I know you talked about a multiracial America, which I thrive for a multiracial America too. I think in a lot of ways we have a multiracial America. We just misunderstood on a lot of levels because of these social class differences and racial differences and everything else, economics. But um, how would you define democracy um, pertaining to your specific line of work? And then maybe I can grasp a little bit better the concept. Yeah, so the first thing that I want to emphasize is I actually make the opposite argument in the book that I don't think that learning about the electoral college, the system of these checks and balances, I don't think that's particularly meaningful for young people. In fact, I take the position that the most meaningful lecture, the most meaningful civic education lessons happen when young people are able to learn from individuals who work beyond existing institutions. That to me is what I imagine civic education to be in its, in its best, most empowering form. In terms of a definition of, of democracy, so I think about democracy as a system of government where through participation, individuals get to uh, collectively call the shots of how, how things are run. I think there are plenty of pieces of evidence that uh, highlight the fact that there are some aspects of the system of government that we currently have in the United States that are inherently anti-democratic. Um, mm -hmm. For example, I raised the point in, you know, the opening chapters of the book where I highlight, you know, what lessons we can learn uh, as policymakers, as researchers from listening to young people. And one of the, the young people I highlight is a young African-American girl who says, you know, 
in 2016, I watched Hillary Clinton get the most votes and she didn't become president because of the electoral college. Mm -hmm. And her civics teacher, his indication was, well, I just need to explain more what the electoral college is. And if I explain what the electoral college is, this will all make sense to the student. Where the mm -hmm. point I'm trying to make in the book is, no, let's sit with that skepticism that the student has. Let's lean into it. Let's investigate the historic roots of the Electoral College, and let's have an honest conversation about whether that form of, of system for electing the president is democratic. Um, mm -hmm. I would take the position that it's, that it's not, but the way in which we get there, I think, is allowing young people to come to that conclusion through historic investigation by exploring their own skepticism of some of these components of, of how our government works. Um, and then finally, you asked about what I, what I mean when I talk about a multiracial democracy. Um, and something that I, I talk about in the conclusion of the text is I envision a multiracial democracy as a system of government in which um, multiracial coalitions of people have the ability to participate, uh, determine the results of elections without fear of retrib retribution from white conservative majorities or minorities rather. So if we think about January 6, in my mind, January 6 is the antithesis of a multi multiracial democracy. And January 6 to me also represents what many white conservatives fear about a multiracial democracy. That is that a presidential election could be determined by a political coalition largely uh, largely built by racially marginalized communities, poor communities, and a smaller subsect of white progressives. So when I talk about multiracial democracy, it's the ability of multiracial coalitions to be able to determine the outcomes of elections and to be the defining voices in the policymaking process. I just, um, I guess for me, that's a difficult concept to grasp because um, I find myself outside of the political system that that um, people talk about. Um, but but that's I guess that's a philosophical difference I have because um, my premise is that we don't have um, but one option, but we have two factions within the one option. Like I see Democrats and Republicans as the same thing because they're owned by the corporations. I don't believe that regular everyday people determine the elections. I believe that the people who donate the money to and the lobbyists, I think they have more power than the everyday people who put these people into power. Um, that's what I personally think. And I guess that's why I have the biggest issue with this idea of um, political participation. But I do like it in the book how you talked about there's more to politics than electoral politics. I'm completely on board with that. I'm actually argue that um, direct action is at this point for me is more important than electoral politics. But I think that goes into a broader problem with people who are politically disenfranchised, which tend to be people who are poor, poor whites, poor black people. Um, and there's a perception because I hear it all the time. Um, I heard it the last election and the one before that and the one before that, that when you don't participate, you don't have a voice. And I think that couldn't be any more flawed a position. Um, I, I think there are reasons why people don't participate in this system. Um, and when you, you have to talk to those people directly to get the root cause of the problem though, is because black people do feel politically disenfranchised as it is. It doesn't matter about this Democrat Republican stuff. It's about, we haven't gotten to a point where we can um, feel like we have the options, the people to represent us because of just um, the tumultuous history we've had in this country, whether it's um, with civil rights, political participation in general. But I almost see it as like, um, it's like you're signing up for something, but you don't know exactly why you're supporting what you are once you're in the system. And, and I think that's why a lot of Black people are, are at the struggle. I'm actually in a panel tomorrow I got invited to, um, 
And it's all black people who are leaving the, the quote unquote, the duopoly, the two party system. And, and this is something that's not covered in the news at all. Like a lot of people, a lot of minority groups that you refer to, a lot of those people are leaving the political system and they're looking for something else because they don't feel like they've been represented enough. Um, but I did, I definitely got that sentiment when I was reading the book that you definitely acknowledge that there's a sentiment that's underlying that's not even satisfied with this um, political, this multiracial dem democratic system. That's still stuff that we got to do before we even get to that notion of a multiracial democratic system. Yeah, I'm happy you took that from the book. So to be clear, and I think you you summed it up well, I think it's incredibly condescending when individuals look at voting as the only way in which people participate in politics. So a theme that I harp on over and over again while writing while writing the book is this idea of civic education should allow young people to determine whether or not they want to participate and on what terms. So for some, that certainly means voting. But for a lot, particularly those who haven't turned 18, those who um, you know, are not United States citizens, for those who don't have the ability to take a day off of work and stand in a uh, two-hour polling station line because the government has closed <laughs> polling stations. Like, there are other ways that individuals decide to participate. So when I say democracy, I mean participation broadly defined. And a lot of times, you do not get the foundation of electoral participation even set until you have these extra systemic social movements, for example. So we don't get to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 without having a more contentious, racial justice-oriented social movement in the United States. So I'm happy mm -hmm. that, you, that you pulled that out of the book. That said, I do. it does seem like we have a bit of a philosophical difference, but within that philosophical difference, like my positionality is certainly different than right. my experience. But the way I view voting is like, I don't say that voting is the most important behavior, but it is an act that I can do one day, every two, every three years, depending on when your municipal elections are, where my vote may not elect a candidate that is transformational, but I may be able to select a vote for a candidate who is going to do less harm and be less in the way when I pursue other forms of political action. Um, for example, I think, you know, um, electing a political leader who maybe is not that much different from the individual across the aisle, but is slightly more sympathetic to social movements and political protests, I think that's something that I also want to have a say in and something that I'm capable of doing one day uh, of the year or so. So I try to think about participation as something that I'm doing every day and mm -hmm. voting is just one tool that I use a few days uh, in my lifetime, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. And um, I, I definitely wish people would look at it more that way that um, it it is kind of condescending when, and, and I love a lot of my friends that I used to work with and stuff, but just this idea that like you're doing something that's just so like powerful by going in and pushing a button once out of every 180 days or something. And I'm saying to myself, that's a lot of stuff that goes in life besides those 180 day spans, you know, that, you know, just, and that's, that's another reason why I thought started this forum is to educate people just in general. I just don't think, um, it's a, we almost have to educate ourselves at times because we have the news telling us one thing and then, you have people on the ground that have completely different experiences. Just like you mentioned, um, J6, um, the people that I associate with and the people around me, we have completely different views on J6. So we see it as completely irrelevant. It has nothing to do with us. Like a lot of black people where I grew up from, they could care less about January the 6th. It just, it has nothing to do with our reality. If anything, it can't hurt us anymore than we felt like we've already disenfranchised. So we don't that's just one extra thing for us it's not like this the world's going to come to an end the way the news media makes it seem 
But the reality is that a lot of people who are struggling paycheck to paycheck didn't care much about January the 6th. I mean, it's more of a political sort of contest with, you know, these two sides fighting all the time. And a lot of everyday people like, you know, what does this have to do with me? And I know that that's not a sentiment that's necessarily, um, it's not widespread, but it's prevalent enough in my circles to where it's like, yeah, I mean, that's other stuff going on besides this, you know, that they're telling us about all the time. Um, but I think a lot of that is just a, a, a what you prioritize. Yeah. And I think some of these quote unquote marginalized communities prioritize different things. And um, the, another thing reading this book is almost, um, it kind of creates a possible monolithic type of um, thing because blacks do support one side of the ruling class more than the other. I totally agree with that. Um, but even with that um, support of the Democratic Party that's prevalent within Black people, I think if, if there was a different system, that wouldn't be the result of the system. I feel like a lot of the people, they, that that's their only choice. You mentioned it earlier. They feel like it's less damaging, um, even if it's not beneficial immediately. Um, those people may calculate that and see that as less damaging than what other uh, what other option they have. But my thing would be, why do we have to do damage control in the first place? Why can't people vote for people who represent them truly? But maybe that's just been too idealistic as far as the system. Um, I think that's where we're misunderstood. We um, politically, um, I'm, it's not that I don't care about politics. It's just that we feel so frustrated every time we see this cycle. It's like, we don't feel like we can do anything about the system because there's not more representation in the government because we feel like it's always the blue team or the red team if you're outside of that that paradigm. Yeah, and I think this is exactly the sort of skepticism that I think we would benefit by sitting with in classrooms mm -hmm. throughout the United States. So if you are thinking about, you know, why people um, are not excited to participate in the red state, blue state contest, as, as you described it, it, it goes back to, you know, what structures are in place that prevent more uh, candidates who are actually representative of these other viewpoints from even being a viable nominee within a, a political party. And I think that's a legitimate, it's an important uh, question in any system that proclaims to be a democracy or aspires to be a democracy. So that sort of skepticism is something that I would encourage teachers to sit with in classrooms rather than doing what I think is the more traditional civic approach, which is explain that skepticism away. I think you could, mm. you could spend weeks or months sitting with, with that sort of skepticism, and that's going to be a more meaningful political experience for the people who sit with it for a bit. Okay, okay, okay. Th that leads me to a question about the teachers that you were with when you were um, doing your book. Were these teachers, um, were they black teachers, white teachers? Like, how was the setup some of the schools you were going to when you were um, doing your work? Yeah, Chicago is a really interesting school district in this regard. So there were moments in the history of Chicago schools, Chicago public schools, where I believe that there was a majority, and if not a majority, pretty close to a majority of, of Black teachers. Uh, that is no longer the case in Chicago public schools. Um, it's a, from a national perspective, a very diverse uh, cadre of teachers who work within Chicago public schools, but just like national trends where I think something like at least for social studies teachers, I think like 70% are white and you definitely see uh, more white teachers in these classrooms, regardless of the demographics of the school. Um, that said, there were plenty of, of black, Latino, uh, Asian educators that are also accounted for in the book. And as I mentioned, these often tended to be the teachers that I describe as social justice oriented educators where, you know, these are individuals who are more willing to 
do what you and I were just talking about, mm -hmm. where something comes up in the classroom that's important for the students. It's completely divergent from the curriculum, but they mm -hmm. find a way to make space in their classroom to allow kids to, to sit with it. And having been able to bear witness to some of these moments while conducting my research, it's incredibly powerful to witness and it's also incredibly meaningful for the students. Yes, I definitely think that's where positionality comes into place. And and I did see you brought up the culture war issue of CRT, which is absolutely crazy because um, when you were writing this book, CRT was like a hot button topic. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Someone that works in the humanities, we don't even use the, the term critical race theory in our own department. Right. I mean, even though we talk about people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins and bell hooks all these different philosophers and writers and theorists we don't go into class and make it a point to talk about critical race theory we simply teach from our experiences and we incorporate it into the class and i think and and conservatives i agree with you on this point the conservatives love to use this um culture war stuff as a way to um belittle culture and um culture is important it should be taught in schools, um, public and private. The main decision why I decided not to teach at the lower level schools is precisely because of these types of issues, because I want to be able to teach adults freely and be autonomous in my own classroom. I don't want people, a school board or a parent, tell me what to teach if I'm the teacher. And that's why when I'm in my Spanish classes, when I see the 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 Spanish 101, the Spanish 202. I'm like, fuck the textbook. I'm going to teach what I want to teach. I'm going to teach um, gay rights. I'm going to teach Black people. I'm going to teach Indigenous people. And the students, it's funny that these people, um, they assume what the students are going to take in and what they're going to react to. But when I actually teach my students all types of topics, they take it in really well from different experiences. A lot of the people I taught in East Tennessee and Middle Tennessee that are conservative-minded students, they took in well to my coursework. They actually said that they appreciated me giving them these different perspectives. Is But I don't want to put, you don't have to put your political agenda into something. The culture is the culture. You teach something and you let people interpret it the way they want to interpret it. But the way they make critical race theory seem is like something completely different, like it's indoctrination, which is just complete BS because it's a legal scholar term anyway it has nothing to do with what they're talking about so it was it's definitely a culture war issue that was during that period yeah this is a, a question that i always get when people read my stuff is they say are you concerned that you know you're going to get framed as advocating for critical race theory and <laughs> the response i always give it's like you pointed out earlier my work focuses overwhelmingly on race rather than class sexuality, these other markers of marginalization, any critical race theorists, Kimberly Crenshaw, I think would read this book and would be like, this is not critical race theory because a key part of critical race theory is, is thinking intersectionally about mm -hmm. topics. And I think a big critique that I've gotten rightfully so of the book is that it's not intersectional enough. It's a valid critique. Right, and right. In and of itself makes it not a theory grounded in CRT, but the, the difficult, the slippage here is CRT is now an um, umbrella term for everything predominantly white conservatives don't mm -hmm. like about education. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a concept that's gotten so unwieldy and out of control that oh, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. The, the lack of specificity in, in public discourse about what it is and what its purpose is supposed to be is, is just, uh, it's truly out of our control at this point. So it's it's part of the book that you kind of just need to throw your hands up and you're like, you know, um, there might be, I've certainly have read a lot of critical race theory, critical race theorists have been formative in how I think about the world, but that doesn't, um, the nuance there is not going to be captured by those who just don't like that. I care that race should be taught in civic education classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and much to your point as well about some of your students, I've had very similar uh, experiences down here at the University of Miami where 
there are quite a few conservative students in my class who will sign up to take a race and politics class, will take my urban politics class, my intro to American class, focuses a lot on race, gender, class, and they come, they engage mm -hmm. deeply with the content. They're able to say, and I welcome them to say like, hey, I don't agree with this, but it's interesting to hear where other students uh, are coming from. And that's exactly the sort of response I see in the research presented in the book, where when white kids learn about the history of marginalized groups, they don't feel bad. They become, no. more, they, exactly. feel, they become more empathetic individuals. And I think that's what's really scary to um, a lot of conservative politicians in this country, individuals like Ron DeSantis, who know oh, that, <laughs> that maintaining their political coalition is kind of contingent upon you know, the white folks in that coalition not developing this empathy towards individuals who have other life experiences than they do. Yeah, it, it, it can really become a messy situation. Like you said, the way they've um, just confused CRT for something else, and you pointed out perfectly, when I read your book, that didn't even come into my mind. Like, even though you mentioned it, because they don't know what CRT is, but we know what it is because we're in those fields. And, and I'm telling people, even within the humanities, people aren't even talking about it like that. So I notice people don't know what they're talking about. They just simply parroting what their favorite politician is saying. And the right. Democratic ones too, it's like, they, it's like they fight about stuff that are like, like, let's take ownership back of that. But I'm like, do you even understand what it is? You know, it's just like, it's just, it got blown out of proportion when it shouldn't have been blown out of proportion because the reality on the ground is that students are receptive to messaging that's different um, when you talk about culture. And I think that's nothing but valuable. Um, but again, part of my apprehension about even going into um, anything but higher education was precisely, I don't want to have to deal with these different avenues and of people telling me what to say and how I should say it, because my experience is very different. When I grew up, I had several Black teachers that influenced the way I teach now. And if it wasn't for those people when I was a kid, I don't know if I would be the same type of educator now or not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, now I definitely relate to um, the book big time. There's, there's actually quite a few more questions I have. Um, we talked about political empowerment, political knowledge. Um, where do you see civic education in the next 10 years as far as, um, um, is there gonna be more pushback towards civic education? Or do you think people are gonna be more um, receptive to um, civic education? You know, I'm I'm feeling optimistic and <laughs> I'm feeling optimistic even um, while sitting in a state that is actively trying to constrain, you know, what it is we can teach in, in social studies classrooms. And the reason I will say that I'm optimistic and I'm going to use history as a lesson is these debates over content, how and what we teach about American history and identity, it's not new. It comes up every <laughs> seven years or so, and these attempts to ban courses um, historically tend to be debates that burn hot and fast. So back in, I believe it was 2010, the state of Arizona banned uh, Mexican-American studies within their state curriculum. And it was in 2017 that a federal judge ultimately stepped in and said that this was a civil rights issue, that the ban was motivated by racial animus. I think, you know, it catches up to people quickly that we don't become more free by limiting the information that we have access to. Mm -hmm. So there's that. <laughs> and, and two, it's, it's almost laughable that across the country, we are developing lists of banned books saying that, you know, middle schoolers, high schoolers cannot and should not have access to during a developmental period of their life where, you know, potentially exploring, uh, pushing back against authority, exploring what it means to be rebellious, is a, a major part of identity formation and you're 
giving kids in a particularly rebellious period a list of books and saying, don't read them. So I don't know that um, in the long run, these policies are going to have the impact that conservatives think they're going to have. And I think what you'll see in the next 10 years or so is what we're seeing in states like Illinois, where they're not even saying kids have to take one civics class. They're saying you need to take two civics classes. You need to teach Black history. You need to teach LGBTQ history. You need to teach Asian American history. And I do think you're seeing a revitalization of civic education and social studies in public schools in some states. And I, I am optimistic that other states in the future will, will follow. But I think there's going to be a bit of time in the near term where we continue to have these fights over who should have a say in, in public education. Yeah, some of the points you just brought up, it's fun. I was thinking about um, this whole idea of censorship now. And um, and I'm, I'm very libertarian in this sense that um, I don't believe in censorship at all. Um, I don't even, even speech that I don't even like to take in. I, I just, if I don't want to watch it or listen to it, I just don't pay attention to it. Um, and we've we've seen a lot of enhanced censorship lately, but it's funny, these same people who are um, conservative, they say that they're all about free speech and the First Amendment. But like you said, it's so hypocritical. This banning book shit is like, that's completely going against your whole view of First Amendment free speech. You're not you're not free speech. You're free speech that's convenient for you and your messaging. So you're really doing the same thing that you're accusing like the other group of people that you don't like politically of doing. You're doing the same thing that they're doing. And um, it's just, like you said, it's very hypocritical for these people to be coming up with these book lists and stuff. Just let people be free thinkers <laughs> and do their own thing and, um, and, and let people decide for themselves um, what they want to take in and stuff. And another point that you made that I think is 100% correct People are going to find ways to get around this stuff, even though even though it's um, not higher education. St teachers are going to teach what they teach and no one's going to be able to do anything about it. People are going to do what they do because I don't believe it's an issue anyway. I believe it's a fabricated issue as it is or whatever. And people just take it and run away with it. But I don't think students are, are really complaining about this stuff. I think it's part of a political agenda. Yeah, I think you're you're spot on. And especially on that that last point about teachers. I mean, prior to starting my work as a researcher, I was a public school teacher. And both in my experiences in the classroom and my observations of how social studies teachers in Chicago navigate all of these institutional constraints, teachers are masterful and strategic at, at doing this. They work in a bureaucracy day in, day out. There are multiple policymakers and pressure points telling them what to teach, how to teach, how they're going to track their students' progress. Like These are individuals who are quite astute at how to navigate these institutional constraints in order to teach in a way that's, that's genuine to them. Of course, like there's, it's important not to be essentialist. Not all teachers are equally adept at this. Not all teachers right. are equally <laughs> willing to put their necks out to continue to teach this stuff um, in spite of some of these constraints, but some are, and they're quite masterful at it already. So there will continue to be agency in classrooms exercised by teachers and students, regardless of, of what states try to prevent them from teaching in the classroom. So I guess my question would go to um, like your future endeavors when when you talk about um, expanding off of this project possibly or doing other projects, do you think that that is a possibility down the road that you would you would have more of a focus on um, social class and and all these other elements? Because you made it very clear, and, and I respect that you weren't trying to feign anything. You you were saying that you were analyzing this more or less from a racial demographic standpoint, and you were very forthcoming about that. Um, but but what about your um, stuff afterwards? Because that's lots of potential in this 
to build on it from it. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that at some point in the near future I can think about what it would mean to have a social justice oriented anti-racist uh you know perhaps more class marginalization focused uh project that looks at historical examples of where we've seen you know class marginalized white communities in this country uh, working together with marginalized Black folks, for example, I'm thinking the Highlander Folk School in, in Tennessee as a historic example where you saw cross-racial coalitions formed on the basis of shared marginalization on a class dimension. And mm -hmm. using those historical examples to imagine what uh, an empowering approach to civic education might look like in other types of communities throughout the country. So... Chicago is a great place to do so social science research, but not every community and not even every major city in the country looks like Chicago. So I'm hoping to expand to think about, you know, what does a meaningful justice oriented civic education look like in white communities, rural communities, and with that necessitates a greater examination of, of class as a dimension of marginalization. Yes. Um, and and I totally, again, understand like what you were trying to do. And that's why I wasn't going to hold anything like that against you as far as uh, like, I think that's where philosophically from a political standpoint, that's where I have more of a class analysis. Mm -hmm. And um, and even when I was growing up as a kid, a lot of my, if I was a kid, I would be saying some of the things that Jasmine said, this young black girl was saying um, when she was talking about you know, the the 2016 election, that would have been me 20 years ago. That would have been something Kiko would have said. But the <laughs> Kiko now is, I'm not that person anymore, but it's because I focus less on, I focus less on, I don't want to call it just identity politics strictly. I focus more on um, what everyone else is struggling with to come from a universal standpoint. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has issues with poverty and, um, it, it can be more disparate depending on where you are in the country. But you did this in Chicago in the metro area. You didn't do this in the middle of Iowa. You didn't do this in the middle of Illinois. You probably would have gotten completely different results. Oh, completely different. And, and, and that's where I've seen more of a commonality with people. And but it's kind of, it all starts with education, though. It all starts back with experience. You still have to educate people about culture, even if you're trying to connect people across social class lines, they still have to be able to accept your culture and accept where you're coming from. And I think that's, we don't have enough of either one of them. I don't think we have enough social class understanding or racial tolerance. And I think the two together will be a great marriage if people kind of open their minds up more to, to what we have more in common instead of focusing so much on the differences. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point and something that I hope to explore. It just, you know, as a white person grew up in a predominantly white space, still like a fairly blue collar uh, working class uh, set of communities. I think I've been socialized to think that too much of a class marginalization identity in white communities without thinking about race leads us to the conversations of, well, I'm marginalized too. So mm -hmm. don't tell me about like these other forms of inequality. Yeah. So that's for me, a lot of how I'm thinking about this topic, I think of the historical examples of when cross-class or cross-gender coalitions fall apart because of racial animus. And the question, and I'm hoping, you know, lessons like from the Highlander Folk School can provide examples of, you know, what does it look like to validate individuals' marginalization on one dimension while also being able to acknowledge different experiences that you have not had. And I think that's the challenge of 
this next project, some of the examples you raise, like the education I'm advocating for in Chicago, uh, does not, it's not going to work in a place like Iowa, Tennessee, et cetera. And that, <laughs> that goes back to a major, major theme in the book that I emphasize is civic education must be meaningfully, meaningfully embedded in an understanding of place. Mm -hmm. So, um, in doing this work, you know, whether I do that work or whether it's others who, who do it after me, it's really about understanding how these different power dynamics manifest, uh, within localities throughout the country. And I think you need to start from that very local understanding and build education up from there. There's so much that you said there about, um, because now you got me thinking about intersectionality because um, you talked about cross-cultural movements in the past. And I think that's that's a very good point you made about cross-cultural movements. But it's almost kind of what happened with these different feminisms that we have, um, especially in my um, field with women's studies. A lot of the times Black women don't, it's like they make the argument that we don't need like white feminist theorists you know like we have our own line of theory we don't need to base it off of you know what people view as classic feminism because we have our own experiences it, it all it goes back to experiences at the end of the day and finding um what is someone willing to give and take because someone else has come from a different point of view too and the different experience so what are both people willing to um, I don't want to say sacrifice, but what are they willing to understand about each other so that they can be cohesive in the same political aims, the same um, informational aims? And, and and that's where the problems come. It, is, it could be one element of that intersectional lens, whether it's a, a class issue. And that's what I've seen a lot lately, just been in academia. There's definitely a classist attitude in academia um, with some of the stuff we're talking about. And I'm like, you have to, even with the people that I used to work with, I'm like, do you realize that these people come from completely different experiences that we do? And we can't expect them to be culturally up to par with us. You know, it's like, that's our job as a teacher is to give give them that information. Like, we just can't shame them because they don't have those experiences. And that's a big problem I see in academia right now is just this condescending attitude towards people who aren't as educated sometimes about these topics and like that kind of defeats the purpose in my opinion and that really bothers me because i feel like as the as a black person the first person in my family to even get a a degree you know let alone a phd and i think you are in a similar situation right you're the first in your family congratulations thank you get a phd you. and for us i think we understand that a little bit more because we don't have that tradition to build on it so we can empathize with people who are coming from different experiences in that regards. And when you come from a whole lineage of people who have that, everyone doesn't think like that and everyone doesn't have that tradition. And so you have to treat people and meet them where they are. And I think there's too much of, you have to listen to what I'm saying, like the expert versus the students. So too much of that is going on right now in academia, but it goes into the class divide that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, for exactly that reason, that's why I try to emphasize in the research that I do, like any sort of prescriptive policy oriented research should be built from the ground up. That is, it's not me, the researcher, prescribing what I think is best. It's really learning from the insights of the experts, in my case, in civic education. Those are teachers, those are students who are in the classes. And our expertise should be built from them, not from the academy or from an academic discipline, so to speak. And that's something in my own teaching now that I really try to drive home with my students who are, many of whom are very policy oriented in terms of what they want to do for their career. I ensure that I always develop assignments where it's like, you're going into communities, you're learning from the true experts, and that's the individuals who live these experiences day in, day out. I try to emphasize and model for them that 
being an expert in a canon of of scholarship does not make you an expert in the lived experiences of any group of people. When you talk about, um, and you mentioned something before that I wanted to touch on um, about this idea of um, black youth and, and Latin youth and, and other groups, that's kind of an issue I have, I guess, um, just I, it's like I can't get rid of my politics when I'm reading this sometimes because I'm thinking it almost reads as like, because when I hear marginalized communities, that means so many different things to me, like people of color. But those kind of things have almost been used to sort of weaponize against people who are forming their own political um, movements and identities. Like I feel like black politics, a lot of me personally, I believe that black politics should only be revolutionary in nature, considering the history that we've had in the country. And I think that there's a danger of us becoming just a genteel class of political participants, um, especially when you're in an area like this, where where you admitted that a lot of the white students are going to private schools or they're being homeschooled. And so you have a public school system that's predominantly black and Latin. So they're almost getting complete, they're getting a different funneling of um, education right there so I could only think that that could affect the civic education component as well. Would that make them um, groom them more to some sort of like a sophisticated political class? Because that's what scares me now, like the current state of the Democratic Party. Like, I feel like the Democratic Party 30 years ago was a lot more grassroots than it is now. I feel like now it's like a black political class of people who are a suit and tie class, who are um, teachers and lawyers and business owners and it's all about being part of this professional corporate class and it's less concerned about being revolutionary as far as um reparations for black people like none of that kind of talk is even mentioned it's all about let's just rise up a little bit more socioeconomically because that's proven that we're advancing as people right and i'm saying to myself that's not really benefit me though because you're advancing in your career that's not political for us that's you you're doing your own thing which is fine but it's like i think there's that false illusion of black politics when really it's just a participation in something that's making us citizens i guess but not really advocating for things that actually affect us like the police issues and um the criminal justice system yeah so if i understand your question correctly there might be a few few things. Maybe there's a concern that what I'm advocating for is essentially um, reinforcing what we oftentimes see in this country where we expect the most marginalized members of our communities, the victims of polis, pol public policies to simultaneously be the saviors of mm. democracy and society. I think that's a valid concern in the way that I you know, talk about it in the book again is that mm -hmm. I don't measure, um, I'm not measuring years down the line whether young people vote or whether they're donating. Because for me, the thing that's really important is whether individuals uh, decide that they want to participate in politics. I think an empowering civic education is one where young people feel as if it's the option, but it's not a form of civic education where they're supposed to feel compelled to do something or required mm -hmm. to do something. So another thing that I'm pretty critical of in, in the, the opening chapters of the book is this idea that civic education should be about mandated community volunteer service. Oh. For, <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of research to show that that's not, uh, not meaningful. But, but with that too, I also, again, I feel like because I'm asking young people about intent to participate, not in one way or even three ways, but I asked them 12 different ways. Many of these participatory avenues are meant to be oriented towards pursuing some of these more um, radical, transformational domains of public policy that you just described, such as reparations, holding the police force accountable, things like that. And I would just note that in Chicago, um, I do feel like if we're looking at political participation among racially marginalized youth, you do see 
um, a more radical potential for politics. For example, largely with the, the help of Chicago public school students, uh, as well as their parents, the city recently just approved what's called a reparations one curriculum. Um, if you're not familiar with this, this is a curriculum that mandates that in Chicago public schools, all kids must learn about the history of police brutality uh, by the Chicago Police Department. Mm. And it was viewed as a form of reparations to uh, the family members whose, uh, whose own family members were victims of police brutality throughout different moments of, of Chicago history. So we don't get these more radical transformational uh, policy outcomes without the participation of marginalized communities, but also I, I want to emphasize in the book that we shouldn't expect victims to also be the saviors of, of democracy. Rather, a meaningful civic education is about feeling that there is an avenue or multiple options to participate, but not a requirement or an expectation to. Yeah, I think I think civic education is definitely going to go through transformations because um, I just think that the, the landscape now, as you mentioned, I think each generation of the youth is um, there is radical potential. But um, I guess it just depends on how you define radical. Um, and for me, transformationally, I just think that the whole system needs to be altered. Like, I don't know. Um, exactly what that altering entails. But like, I think that's where the transformation needs to happen is in the political system itself. And because the radicalism is always going to be tamed because we, we have this kind of a system, I think, that's designed to almost um, register a clientele. But once the clientele is in the database, the action sort of levels out. And I see this happen so much. That's the reason why um, and it's because everyone has so much going on, I feel. I think people are so worried about their finances and they're worried about their families and everything else and their loved ones. And um, they feel like that's the best thing, that that's the best that they can do. And there is a risk when you are viewed as too revolutionary. There is a risk. Um, we have a big history in this country where... Um, a lot of the black revolutionaries were assassinated. And I think for that reason, because um, they were threatening the system that was in place. And I feel like that's why the radicalism right now, especially in black communities is not there. Like I think it should be because um, we have basically been put in a position to sort of participate in something and measure the risk, you know, accordingly. But, but you can only do what the system allows you to do, I guess. I mean, which is a really unfortunate part. Um, I, guess, I, I guess the best thing to do is um, conversations are important. We got to keep having the conversations. Um, I, th I would advise people who are frustrated with the political system to reach out to all different types of people. Um, I know I've had to do this myself. Um, this has almost been a rehabilitation for me. Um, this podcast has because I don't know if I would be able to have these same conversations three years ago. I was just so um, psychologically and mentally just anguished just from everything else going on. And just the division was just so hard. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way to connect with people than this. Like, this is just not, this is not helping out anybody. And, um, and I urge people to just, there's definitely something you have to you have to risk you have to calculate the risk that's just like for instance um i was telling my wife yesterday i'm interviewing some presidential candidates coming up for 2024 and i don't interview democrats or republicans explicitly because they already get the spotlight and so i end up i interview independents unaffiliated libertarians and different types of people socialists communists whoever it is um and I actually wanted to interview Huey Newton's son. Mm. Huey Newton from the Black Panther Party has a son. And so I went on his side. I looked at everything. And I'm like, let me see if I can get this voice on my show. And I looked at his views. I was like, fuck no, I'm not going to bring him on my show. Because 
I because once he ostracized, like he specifically said, like he refers to white people as this and gay people as this. I'm like, nope. And so I definitely agree with that kind of stuff. You can only take so much. That's when the conversation dies. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that are. I think they get fairly unjudged. They get fairly judged. And maybe I've done some to judge myself in the past. And I apologize to those people. But it's hard to it's hard to navigate that landscape when you're a part of these communities, if you're gay, if you're black. And that's where the culture stuff is really important, because when you say that I can't teach this in the classroom, what you're saying is that my position doesn't have any effect on life, but it does. And this is an example of how it does affect people. You know, like you can't even communicate with people if they don't accept this parameter. And if you can't have an open conversation and address people, but you have to say white people and call them a name or call gay people a name, then it's like, I can't have a conversation with you because that's too much of a threshold for me to have to get over. And um, it, it, it's really tough. It, it's a landscape. And you have that with Black groups. A lot of Black advocacy groups are very homophobic. I've, I've said this a lot of time on my pod. When the marginalized people thing gives me problems because um, I feel like it's almost putting people in a box because a lot of these same people aren't advocating for um, other communities that are marginalized. Like a lot of black people I know would not advocate for gay people, trans people. They wouldn't ever. They only see it as a black issue. They see reparations as a black issue. They don't care about people's sexual orientations or anything else or identities. And that's where I think the danger is. That's why we have to talk to different types of people because um, these same people who, I don't even call them victims um, because you're victimizing something about somebody else at that point when you're using that kind of language. You, are you really a victim at that point? You're becoming a, an oppressor. Yeah, so, I mean. Yeah. That, that, I wasn't sure if you had a response or anything, but I, I was just kind of <laughs> rambling for a second. I saw you kind of like listening and stuff. But um, now these are very difficult things to talk about, you know. And but we have to calculate these things as people. Like, what are we willing to take in from opposition? And, and, and it's very tough. Yeah, I think you're spot on both with regard to you know political discourse, but also how it is we, um. Think about navigating some of these conversations and in, in classrooms. I think Bell Hooks says it best in the description of, you know, we can't uh, ever expect our students to show their humanity, to have these vulnerable conversations about difficult topics if we as educators are not also willing to model what that looks like in the classroom as well. So I think your broader point and and your last series of statements is spot on, which is it it takes a degree of vulnerability to have these conversations with different groups of people, and they're not always going to be comfortable conversations. But any sort of 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 movement or cross cutting uh, social justice uh, coalition is going to require that these conversations happen, even uncomfortable ones. Yes, and um, it's funny. I'm just curious how. Um, people are going to take in the conversation. I, I've enjoyed this conversation right here. And um, I actually want to um, have you back on like once your book is published. And um, I want to be able to promote that. Is there any way I can put the links in right now and promote that for you? So the links are not available at this moment. I think I'm like a month or two out from that. But as soon as uh, it is available. I'm happy to loop you into it. And I'm also happy to come back on to discuss it when it's, you know, in the flesh here. <laughs> so can we expect anything that's different than what I've already read? Um, it's going to be a pretty similar version of what you've already read. Okay. And this is due to be released July the 1st, 2023? 2023. Right. 2023. Is there anything in the book um, that you feel like we under um, emphasize that you want to maybe talk about with the audience um, before conclusion? 
Yeah, I would just emphasize the final chapter of the book focuses on civic education, that something is embedded in a larger civic landscape, be it a neighborhood, be it a, a school ecosystem. And while you could read that chapter as just a addition of, you know, civic education is something that takes place in a school which has these other series of constraints. The broader theme here is something that we talked about just a bit ago, which is that any meaningful civic education reform needs to be meaningfully embedded in a deep understanding of different places. And that has to do with neighborhoods, that has to do with cities, that has to do with rurality and uh, urban areas, suburban areas. So. I'm not trying to present a one size fits all solution to civic education. It's meant to be a framework that that others can use to think through what a meaningful education of this kind would look like in different places with different populations of people with a different set of experiences. Um, how would you rate your own civic education growing up? How would you rate that? I feel like I had a wonderful civic education growing up. I had an amazing ninth grade United States history teacher named Regina Seabrook. She was, you know, quite open about how um, her racial identity as a black woman, as a single mother, as a as a Muslim shapes how she thinks about United States history. And I'll never forget the first day of class uh, quite theatrically, we had, you know, the district mandated textbook sitting on the desk. Mm -hmm. And she said something along the lines of this is the book that you have to read. But this is going to be the real textbook. And in the back of the room, she had <laughs> copies of Howard Zinn's A People's History. Of, oh, yeah, you refer yeah, to this quite a bit. Yeah, which is the book that I then turned to as one of the interventions in my own study. And um, a large part of that is because I think, um, you know, that was an, a, a meaningful experience for me where I was taught about the pedagogical importance of unlearning history and filling in some of the gaps that were created by intention. Um, so I do think that I had a, a great uh, civic education, both in school and through the different political organizations and uh, I was involved in, and of course, my family provided me with a, a great civic education as well. I like the parts of your book where you kind of gave that historical um, background. It, it um, I had Margaret Kimberly on. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she uh, is a co-founder of the Black Agenda Report. Okay. And it's the only Black leftist um, outlet in the country. Um and again, we won't go into like what's left and all that stuff, but but that's the way they define it as um, more of a revolutionary left um, lens. And she wrote a book called um, Prejudential, Black American Presidents. And we talked about that book. And she has her book set up kind of like she has these um, historical, um, I guess, overviews, you know, about these different laws that were passed and everything just the history of black politics basically in a nutshell in the last 200 years in the United States. So I think some of your viewers would um, like that book as well, just to have an alternative perspective on the history of black politics in the country, because I, it reminded me a lot of that reading her book when I was just kind of getting that framework from you. And so I appreciate um, the historical information because that's something that people take for granted. They don't have, um, that kind of um, information that's taught to them in the schools. And from what I gather, you would think that that's a good idea to to put that kind of implementation in the schools. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'll be sure to check out her book as well. I have it pulled up on my screen. Oh, cool. Yeah, I knew you were doing something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm trying to think, Um, is there anything else um you would like to discuss this last few minutes um before we go? Because... I'd probably have to cut it in the next five minutes or so. So I don't know if you want to talk about anything else. I think we pretty much covered it. I, I'm appreciative that you let me talk about so many different parts of the book and also how my own identity figures into that. So I've really enjoyed this conversation. 
I have too, Matt. And like I said, um, audience, I want to have you back on if you if you're gracious enough to rejoin us in the of course, summer. Yeah. And um, where can people contact you, Matt, if in case you people want to reach out to you directly? Yeah, you can find me at MatthewDNelson.com uh, or I am on Twitter as Nelson underscore Matt. And Nelson is N-E-L-S-E-N, not O-N. So. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I won't mess up your name at all. Okay. When I put it in the description and everything. But Matt, I appreciate you um, joining. Maybe we can chat a little bit after the interview. But beautiful people. Um, who do we have next? We have Athena Mason next. We're going to talk about a new political party that she formed in the state of Texas. And then next week, we have um, several guests lined up. We have Ashaki Nichols. Um, she's running for president of the United States, unaffiliated. And we have John Sasevich on February the 28th. He's running as an independent for the president of the United States 2024. And we have quite a few people coming in. I have three scholars lined up to talk about the Ukraine-Russia situation as well, um, based on the book, you, uh, Flashpoint in Ukraine, um, how the US drives um, World War III. Um, and so there's a lot to talk about on the forum. We have Dawn Duke coming up in April with a panel. She has a new book out um, called Mayaya Rising. And it talks about um, female icons in black history in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we have, quite a few speakers, interview people down the, the road, and um, beautiful people. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>